Bonjour. Kekat Piton is an occasion. What I just said is my Indian name that I've been given by the spiritual grandfathers, which means uh, one who sits with sacred gifts and items. My name is Christian Abel Morso. That, that is the name that was given to me by my father, Noro Morso, and my mother, Harriet Morso. When my mother was young and my father was young, they met in St. Joseph's Hospital. They were both sick at the time. My father was there for TB. My mother just had an operation removing one of her lungs. My mother lived her whole life with just one lung. Just one lung. It wasn't easy living with Norval. It was fun sometimes, but it wasn't easy because of alcoholism, because of destruction. I was born in Red Lake, Ontario. Born and raised in Red Lake, Ontario. When I was about four or five years old, my father and my mother had gotten a divorce. It was my mother that requested a divorce, and she wanted to divorce my father. She just couldn't live with the man no more. That is when my father left me and moved on and to continue his art his art that he uh, created back in the early 60s. When my father had left, he had taken uh, me and my sister Lisa and put us in a children's home in Red Lake, Ontario. So our family was divided at that time. When I was in the children's home, I spent about a year and a half in there with my sister, my mother, end up meeting another man by the name of Joshua Hudson from Satchel Lake, Ontario. And within six months, he managed to get a home for us. And he, and he said to my mom, if you stay with me, I promise I will stay with you until your kids are fully grown. I was so happy that day. I wanted to get out of that children's home after being in there for a year. Stuff I went through in that children's home as a five-year-old was just the same thing that my brothers and sisters and my fathers and my uncles and my grandfathers went through this residential school system. So that day when my mother came over with Josh Hudson and she said, I'm going to get you out of here. I'm gonna make us a home again. I was so happy. Lisa was happy. And sure enough, six months later, we got to leave. We got to go to this house that my mother and Joshua house Hudson created together. I was happy there for a while until Josh's true colors came out. In my lifetime, I think Joshua Hudson damaged me the worst. He did everything. So I lived with it. I didn't understand why, why he was like that. All I knew is that I was with my mom. That's all I care about, being with my mom, so. When I was in grade three, I had this white teacher, I forget her name, I wish I could remember her name, because she gave me the best advice I ever got in my life. She asked me, how come you don't want to go outside, Christian? I said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't like these. I don't like them out there. I want to be alone. I don't like the way they talk to me. I don't like the way they treat me. Or I just want to be here. And I said to her, I don't. I wish I was an Indian. I wish my skin 
was like this. I wish I was white, I told her. Then she says to me, Christian, you know, when God made you, he tried to make you perfect. Think of it this way, when you're a bread, she says, God put you in an oven to make you. And then when he pulled you out, he pulled you out too early and you were too white, she told me. So he tried again, put, made another batch, put you in there, pulled you out again, but he pulled you out too late and you end up black and burnt. So, he tried again. The third time, she says, he put you, God put you in the oven. You came out just right, just perfect, nice and brown, the way you are. That was the best advice I, I ever got to start learning about myself and respecting myself. I always remember what she said to me about being pulled out the right time, being perfect, just the way I am. I was probably about nine years old when I, I seen my father again, when he came back into my life. And uh, when he had came back into my life, I think that was the very first teaching that I ever learned from my father. I got a call from my, my mother one time. She was at her grandfather's place and says, your father's here in town today. I was happy and I ran over to my grandfather's place. And when I got there, he says, let's take a walk. So we walked back from my grandfather's place to his hotel room. On my way there, I seen a bee on the side of, on the, side of the uh, sidewalk there. And I said to my dad, I was trying to impress him. And I said, dad, look at me. I went up to that bee and I, slapped and I killed it. And my father got upset at me. He said, why would you do that to something that wants to live like that? I told him I was trying to impress you, show you something, what I can do. So that was my first teaching ever from, from my, my father, was to respect life. Not only animals or people, or his or even mine, but everything that, uh, that the grandfathers had created. By the time I got into grade seven, I was about nine years old. That was the first drink I ever had. God, did I ever love it. Took everything away. Made me feel good. Made me forget. And when I started drinking, I started getting aggressive. I started uh, pushing back. I started pushing back and the principal started noticing. One day, me and my sister and another girl named Darlene Lassard, a white girl. We were playing outside during recess. I went out there and we're having fun. We're all playing, joking. And all of a sudden she tripped and she hurt herself and the recess teacher saw that. She didn't know we were playing though. She sent us all to the office that time. Me, my sister, and Darlene. When we got to the office, I knew what I was gonna get. I knew what I was gonna get. So we're sitting there in her office. She didn't even ask what happened. She just looks at me and she says to me, are you gonna be a man and take these ladies' licks? I said, okay. So Darlene and Lisa sat there. And her punishment back then was five licks on each hand with a leather ruler. So I took mine first. I took my sister's five on each hand and I took Darlene's five on each hand as well. And then she says to Darlene and Lisa, you guys go back to class now. Go do your work. And I was sitting there alone with her and she looks at me. She
She tells me, you're the dirtiest, ugliest person I ever met. Go back to your classroom. Go do your work. I went back to my classroom, but I couldn't hold my pencil because my hands took 15 licks on each side, 30 of them. After I got to grade 10, my mother and Joshua Hudson, they were at the end of their relationship, and then Josh actually kept this promise to my, my mother that he stuck around until me and Lisa and the kids were fully grown. And they split up. And at that time, I, I began babysitting for another alcoholic family on the other side of town. Every time I was done babysitting, my gift was to get drunk, my turn. And I did. <laughs> Hell, I got drunk. And that was my gift from them. The gift of alcoholism. I never really had a home growing up. I never did see my father again until about 10 years later, when I was 19 years old. I had uh, gotten a call once again from my mother saying that uh, your father is asking if you and your brother can come and visit him. And I was back in 1990, I must have been about 19 years old. When I got there, he says to me, I need your help, he says. I need your help to help me uh, paint some backgrounds, he, he told me. There's one day that uh, where I really got into, uh, into really uh, getting into it, where I kind of felt the spirit move within me to uh, continue, uh, continue working to basically just to please him, I guess, as, as I did when I was nine years old. But this time around, I knew I was actually doing the right thing this time with, so. So one day I have asked him if he can cut a bunch of canvas and uh, he gave it to me and he said he didn't sketch anything on it but he told me he said you can do whatever you want with it any color you want I don't care just put the paint on the canvas he says to me, don't be an artist just put the paint on the canvas that's what you're here for so I did that I did that the whole day I must have done about 30 or 40 backgrounds for him I ran out of places to put them on the table on the floor and so the next logic thing was to put them outside on the grass. So I put them, started laying them on the grass and soon enough I've, I've seen uh, traffic starting to slow down. I think it was the colors that were grabbing everybody from, from stopping and slowing down. And that was my first time I ever really got to uh, taste uh, the colors, I guess, the images. I only stayed there me about uh, a month, month and a half around there, knowing it was too far from home, I guess. Uh, and leaving my mom with her health like that, I knew my, my mother wasn't uh, getting any better or she's getting older and I knew her time may come sooner or later. So I had left and I went back to, uh, went back to Sandy Lake. And when I went back to Sandy Lake, that's when I met, uh, my wife, my wife Maureen Morso. It wasn't too long after that, maybe about a year later, when I had my first born. I remember the first time I ever seen Kyle. I was walking back from my grandfather's place on the other side of the reservation on Sandy Lake. I was on a big white van stop. My wife was sitting in the passenger seat with a uh, with Kyle. So I got into the, uh, the back door and I sat there. As soon as I sat down, she turned around, she put Kyle in my hands and I looked at him. And I said, you're mine, you are me. I'm not gonna do what has been done to me. 
when Kyle was a baby, he was just like any other little baby. He would uh, do everything. Kakkenagegun was his first favorite word, which means everything. I had high hopes for Kyle. I always said to myself, I'm going to teach him everything that I can, how to hunt, how to paint, stories, legends of our people. I end up uh, getting into a domestic with uh, my wife and I end up being sent to Kenora for my very first time I ever tried to uh, try to deal with my alcoholism that I had uh, that I started at the age of 10. I remember uh, walking out of the uh, Morningstar uh, detox center and I began walking in Kenora there's a big musky fish there on the side of the river there and once I got to that musky uh, fish there I felt a desire that uh, as I walked there, I was beginning to think, I may have lost my family, I may have lost my children, I may have lost my job and everything. I was down and low and I began to think, well, if I was back in 1990, if I would have just stayed with my father instead of coming back and creating this family, I was wondering, how would I be today as an artist 10 years later? How would I be? At least I would have something to fall back to. To, to live a life, to have a life, and the life that I had that night. So it came over me to where I offered tobacco in front of that fish, and I said a prayer. I said, Grandfather, if you ever, ever give me another chance to learn, to listen, and to understand what my father is trying to teach me, I won't waste my time. And I put the tobacco in the river and I walked away. Then again, after that, I ended up getting my family back. I was proud of him the day he went to high school. I told him, I'll move out with you so you can do your grade nine. We'll take Josh to so he can do his grade eight. So for them to get his grade nine education, I had to go out there and fund him myself just so he can get his grade nine education. And he did, he did good. And in the summertime, he says, let's go home, Dad. It's time to go home for a while. So I let go of the house, sold all the furniture, gave it away, went home with him and then Next, next following September, he applied again for uh, high school for grade 10. And he says to me, Dad, I want to try to do this on my own. I said, no, I'll, I'll move out again with you if you want. He said, no, Dad, I got to do this. I got to do this on my own, he says. He says, I, I have to, I got to try this. So he did, I let him go. But I always made sure that whatever my connecting flight, it would be out of Thunder Bay so I can spend time with my son. And just before he passed away, the last time I ever got to hold my son or even speak to him, he says to me, Dad, I think I want to come home. I told him, son, if you want to come home, I'll take you home. Come with me to the airport in the morning. And if there's room on the plane for you to get on, you'll come home with me. But think about it, I told him. Think about it tonight. So he went to bed that night. Next morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, he went to the airport. And when we got to the airport, I asked him, so what do you want to do? You want to come home or you want to stay? He says to me, Dad, I think I'll tough it out. I'll try at least till the end of the month. He says, I'll try it till the end of the month. If I don't like it, then I'll, then I'll come home. So I said, okay. I gave him a big hug. My very last words to Kaya was, take care of yourself. I love you, son. Goodbye. 
I don't know why I said goodbye. I never ever said goodbye to him. Not once in my life I ever said that. I don't know why I said it that day. While the month came up, he never did come home. The day I heard he was missing or didn't come home, I jumped on that evening flight from Key Elm to uh, Thunder Bay. And I, uh, it was dark when I landed there and I was in the plane. I looked down at the city, the city lights, and I said to myself, somewhere in that city, my son is, my son's there. But I couldn't find him for 14 days. He actually came back himself. His body came back up after spending two, two weeks in the water. Every day I think about water. Every time I have a drink of water, I wash my hands. I think of water and I think of my son. Every day. He came into this world and did what he had to do. Everybody has a purpose in life. I don't know what's mine yet, but he fulfilled his. His purpose in his life for giving up his spirit and all these other six other children was to better our education because of the ripple effect that still affects our people today. It wasn't until 2002 again where I got another phone call from my father and he's asked me to come and see him. He told me he was sick with uh, Parkinson's disease. So, And again, me and my brother Eugene flew out there to go see him and uh, went and picked him up and uh, brought him back to uh, Sandy Lake, Ontario. And uh, we took him to Kibo, my First Nation community. And I remember that night there when I, when I said, when I made that prayer to the grandfathers in front of that fish, I remembered it. And I always wanted to keep my word with them, so my heart was set already. I knew what I wanted to do, what I had to do, and what I needed to do. Not for him, you know, this was for me this time. I knew what he was able to teach me. So one morning in Kibel, and he says to me, son, can you please pass me that uh, piece of paper? for a canvas, he says, I want, and give me a pencil, he says. So I said, okay, I gave it to him, and, and then he looked at me, and he says, here, he gave it back to me. He says, I want you to draw me something, so. I said, okay, and then again, I, I wanted to please my dad, and I, and, I tr and I grabbed the paper, and I grabbed the pencil, and I was doing, doing like this, trying the best that I can, and, and he looked at me, he says, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? You told me to draw you something. That's what I'm drawing. He says, no, 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 like this, son. He says, give me that paper. Give me that pencil, he says. So I gave it to him. And he says, you know, the way you were doing, he says, you, were, you are the one who was doing it, he says. But if you do it this way, he says, when you tried it, you were like this. You were pulling the pencil like that. And it was you that was creating that image. He says, but if you do it this way, he says, then he grabbed the pencil and he lifted it up halfway up and held it like this, where I was holding right at the point, and he put it down, and he goes like this. But if you do it this way, then you know that it's the spiritual grandfathers that has given you that image. He says, you see that? He says, you see the, see the letter, the pencil guide? guide the image, and then that's when you know that's the spirit giving you this image. About three or four years prior, after that, I went into a sweat lodge ceremony to get my Indian name. And I, when I went into there, I uh, went to the shake and tent ceremony and the conductor uh, translated back from their spiritual grandfathers. And he says to me, the spiritual grandfather, ever since you left the spirit world, They've always known you as K. Katapitan, one who sits with sacred gifts and items. When I first heard that name, I was kind of a little down. I didn't, you know, I was kind of hoping that it would be a, a Thunderbird name, like my father, He's something strong, something mighty. But uh, the guy that I went to the, uh, the uh, ceremony with, he says to me, 
Christian, don't worry about it. You know, your name is just as powerful as your dad. I said, well, what does it mean? He tells me, there are many ways you can say it, but this is the best way I can tell you right now, which is one who sits with sacred gifts and items. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm sitting with sacred gifts and items that came from the spiritual world. When I went to the uh, shake and tent ceremony, when I got my Indian name, at the same time, you're supposed to get your colors. And uh, when, I, when I had uh, gotten there, and uh, I was wondering, how come the conductor didn't give me any colors? So I stood outside, and I waited. And, I, and when the conductor that sat in the shaken, in the shaken tent, and I had asked him, uh, how, come he didn't, how come they didn't give me colors, my grandfather's? And he says to me, cake house, be tongue. They're all your colors, he says. They're all your colors. My father always had, had told me, you know, when we come from the spiritual world, that the grandfathers, the four spiritual grandfathers, they know who we are, they know who we're going to be, they know what our purpose is, and they know when we're going to come back again, they tell us. They, there's a, they call it the red road. And that's the red road that, I'm, that I got to travel on, that my father travels on too as well. He says, you have to go to course. You have to go to course, son. You got to stay on the road. Uh, my father, when he began to teach and preach and, and share with the rest of the world back in the early 60s, he wrote the Bible of the woodland art. He's the one who created this form of art. Before him, there was nothing. There was no pictures, there was no scrolls, there was nothing up there, no teaching or nothing because of the spiritual taboo that was put on our, our people, which was if we were to share this out of our, our community or our reserve, within one year, we would be no more. So basically, uh, you know, something, you die or whatever, you know. But my father said he had, a, he had the four spiritual grandfathers came to him and said to him, you, we want you to do this because our language is being lost today and all our teachings are being lost today. Even So we need you to, uh, to uh, share this with the rest of the world before it's all gone. When I started an image, I have no idea what it's going to be. You know, it's uh, like I had told you the way my father had taught me. And, but it's basically once I put the pencil to to the canvas and let it go, and that's when when I begin to uh, see what's coming out. And as I as I begin to sketch it and look at it, I begin to realize the stories and the legends that my father uh, had told me. Some of it. Sometimes I think it's going to be this or it's going to be that, or but uh, it's not always, not always up to me what's actually going to be coming out of, out of me as well. The real thing is, this is not just a painting. These images here came from where I came from. They came from the spiritual world. They came from the grandfathers. These images here are alive over there. And this is what it is. Just, it's just not no ordinary painting that people is, that, that it is. This is what my father told me. You know, because it comes from the grandfathers in the spiritual world, this is what it is. It's a scroll. These are icons. These are th traditional teachings, ceremony teachings, legends, and everything. I had a grandfather, mate, and he lost three sons before he passed away. And my, my grandfather told me, it's so hard to lose a son because you believe and you trust that they're going to live longer than you are. And then you end up burying them before you go. That's the worst pain any man could ever get. That's the pain I, I know now. I buried my father and I buried my son already. But I'm still here. I'm still here for a reason. I came from the spirit world before I came here. Before I came here, 
The spiritual grandfathers knew me as Keikat the Pita. And they knew why I was supposed to come here. My father had a purpose. My father had a masterpiece. Man changes into Thunderbird. Maybe this is my masterpiece. Maybe not, I don't know. The reason why I did this painting here was an honor because of my son that I had lost recently. It's hard to lose a son.